let's talk about sharpening. So, one of the most common questions I get asked is how I sharpen my tools. Clearly, I have a system here. This is a system I've been using for probably five or six years. You can choose to copy if you wish. You can choose to employ some of the methods that I use in your own sharpening system. I don't care. The only thing I care about is that you get a piece of steel sharp and do so quickly so that you can get back to cutting wood. That's my main objective here. So let's get into how I actually sharpen my tools. So the first thing I'm going to do when I need to sharpen up is, of course, disassemble my tool. I'm going to carefully remove the blade from the body of the plane. I'm going to remove the chip breaker, just like so. And I'm going to check for any defects in the plane blade right here. I'm just kind of feeling the edge of that blade to see if there's any major dents or dings in there. I should also have been able to tell that when I'm actually taking a cut, if there are any major undulations in that surface quality, then I know there's gonna be some damage to the edge. Right now, it feels fine, it looks fine, so I know I just need to give it a little lick and clean up that edge. What I've got here are man-made water stones from a company called Ohishi. Now, I've used several different stone types and sharpening setups over the years, from diamond stones to oil stones. I've tinkered in ceramic stones. These are my favorite stones. They're not cheap, I admit that. I will tell you that right off the jump. But the edge that I get off this 10,000 stone is the best edge I've ever gotten. So I'm comfortable spending the money to get a stone that's gonna give me the best possible edge rather than tinkering around with other systems. You may not be in that same place and that's fine. We will discuss that later in the video. For right now, I just wanna show you the technique that I use, no matter the stones you're actually using. Now what I've got here besides just a holder for my stones is a series of stop blocks at different distances from the edge, allowing me to create a different angle using a honing guide. Now, I did not create this. This is a template that is still available on the Lee Nielsen website. It is fantastic and it is worth the build in my opinion. This probably took me 20 minutes to actually make. The other thing that I use is this honing guide. I will admit right off the jump, a honing guide is not necessary. It is a luxury item, but it is a helpful luxury item, especially for beginners who are uncomfortable or just learning how to freehand sharpen. Now, you can see here that I'm using a double bevel situation. I've got a hollow grind in my primary bevel, and I've got a secondary bevel at a higher angle. My primary bevel is somewhere in the range of 20 to 25 degrees. I don't actually care what this angle is. All that matters is that it's below the secondary angle, which I set at 35 degrees. Whether or not you choose to use a hollow grind or a flat bevel or a single bevel or even a convex bevel, that's fine. That's dealer's choice, whatever makes you happy. My goal is to get a keen edge meeting a polished back face as quickly as possible. And this system I have found allows me to remove as little material as possible and therefore often creates the fastest system. I'm gonna slide my plane blade right into my honing guide. I'm going to press it up against my 35 degree stop and I'm just gonna lock it down. And now I can go right to my stones. I'm gonna take my blade, go right on my 1000 stone and start going back and forth. Now what I'm going to do with light pressure on my fingertips is do somewhere in the range of 8 to 12 strokes. Check. And now what I'm going to look for is a tiny little burr that runs all the way across the piece. And all a burr is, is the residue of us abrading the surface. So it's the steel kind of folding over like that. You'll feel just the tiniest little lip on the backside of this blade. Not quite there or not quite as big as I want it to be. So I'll take another eight. Lift off, feel it. And I wanna make sure that burr is going corner to corner. And that feels good. Now. Before I move to my 10,000 stone, I'm actually going to put a camber on this blade. By the way, camber is just the British word for round. I don't know why it's called a camber. I'm not British. What I'm going to do, just like I did before, fingertip pressure, except now I'm gonna put more pressure on the left-hand side, and I'm gonna take four to eight strokes. Freeze. 
pressure on the right side. Lift off. I'm going to check my burr again. Feels beautiful, feels good. And all that's doing is putting the slightest of rounds on this blade, maybe by three thousandths, five thousandths, ten thousandths of an inch. Who actually knows? But it's going to prevent these corners from digging into our material once we actually get our blade set up. Now I'm going to take a rag, wipe off my wheel, and without changing anything on this setup, I'm going to go right to my 10,000 stone. Maybe drizzle a little bit more water on there. Right over my 10,000 stone, and I'm going to do the exact same thing. I like to flip this around just to make sure I wear it evenly. Now I'm going to do the same thing I did on the 1000 stone, put more pressure on the left hand side. Another 8 to 12. Same thing going to the right hand side. That burr still feels good. And then I'm going to come out and just pop this out of my honing guide. And I have a highly polished secondary bevel on this face meeting this face, but this face is not yet highly polished. So it's not perfectly sharp yet. Now we have to hone the back of this. So now my bevel has been addressed, but of course a sharp piece of steel is two highly polished surfaces meeting at an intersection, regardless of what that angle is. I've got one highly polished surface, but I haven't polished the back of my blade yet. So let's go ahead and do that. And I'm gonna cause a little controversy here with something called the ruler trick. Now, a gentleman named David Charlesworth, who was a British furniture maker, a brilliant maker, and an even better teacher, came up with the ruler trick as a kind of workaround for honing the entire back of the blade. He's not the first person to put a back bevel on a plain iron that's been around for centuries. However, he is kind of the one who made this a controversy. I don't know why, it's a brilliant little trick. So here's how this works. So my goal at this stage of sharpening is to polish the back face all the way up to where it meets the edge. All of this, it's great to have that highly polished, but it doesn't affect the cutting surface. The only part that matters is the very tip. So I could stay here and have this flat on the stone and go back and forth and polish that entire face. I did that for years. There's nothing wrong with that if that's how you choose to work your plain irons, but by taking something very thin, maybe a half mil, maybe a little bit less, something like this ruler and laying it down on my stone and then laying my blade on top of that and rubbing it back and forth, what I'm doing is I'm essentially creating a very tiny back bevel on this blade. And you can see, let's see if I can focus in on this. Come on camera, you can do it. There it is. You can see right at the very tip. You see that change in color down here? See how it goes from kind of this dull up here to this bright, polished, reflective surface right at the tip? That's due to the ruler trick because instead of honing like this, it's getting honed like this back and forth and it's creating the tiniest back bevel on here. And when I say the tiniest back bevel, I mean somewhere in the range of a quarter of a degree to one degree, somewhere like that. It's negligible. But I'm gonna place this ruler down and I'm just gonna go back and forth like this. I have no idea what the stroke count is on here. I just kind of go back and forth two or three times. And then I remove it. And what I should have is a highly polished surface right at the very tip. So now theoretically, I have a sharp piece of steel. The last thing I'm gonna do is just check it for sharpness. Now, I'm not recommending you do this. What I often do is I just run my finger very lightly over the tip to make sure that I can feel for any imperfections in there. You can very easily slice your finger. So again, not recommending you do this. I'm just trying to be honest with you as to how I go about sharpening my tools. Some people like to try to shave the arm hair or the finger hair, which is fine. This is cutting cleanly. I don't care if this cuts hair. 
What I care about is whether or not this cuts wood. So now that this is good and sharp, the last thing I'm gonna do is wipe this down with a rag that has some oil on it to prevent rust. I will acknowledge this rag is soaked in jojoba oil, which is bougie and fancy and from Lee Nielsen. You don't need jojoba oil. Three-in-one oil or some light machine oil that you can buy cheaply at Harbor Freight will do just fine. This is just what I have because Lee Nielsen connections in the past. So this blade is perfect. Let's get it set up in the plane and actually make sure it works. All right, so first move is to take my freshly sharpened blade and attach my chip breaker. I'm gonna set this somewhere around a 16th to a 32nd away from my cutting edge. Lock this down. And then I'm going to slide this carefully into my casting, making sure I don't bang that freshly sharpened edge against any of the steel components in here. Slide my lever cap on, close that, and now it's time to set my plane. Got a set block around here somewhere. I don't know, guess we're using a different one. So very briefly on how I like to set my planes, I'm just gonna take a piece of wood that's somewhere in the range of a quarter inch to three eighths of an inch wide, doesn't actually matter, the species or the width. I'm gonna throw that in my vise and I'm gonna try to take two shavings. So I'm gonna set my plane on the wood like this and I'm gonna try to take a pass on either edge of the blade. So I'm gonna take one here and then I'm gonna take one here. It's not taking a shaving in either location so I'm going to advance the blade. I can hear it just touching over here, just scraping, but nothing over here. So I'm going to advance the blade a little bit until I get a shaving. Excellent. Now, you can see I've gotten a shaving on this side, but not on this side. And what that's telling me is that the blade is ever so slightly like this, right? It's sticking farther out on this side than it is over here on this side. And what I need to do is correct that blade so that it's sitting parallel to the sole. The way I do that is by adjusting this lateral adjustment lever back here. So I'm going to push that lever towards the side that's taking the heavy cut just a little bit, and I'm gonna to try to take another cut. Nothing, so I'm gonna advance the blade. Okay, now we're in a good spot. Check this out. Decent shaving on the one side, much, much lighter shaving on the other side. So we're getting somewhere, but we're not quite there yet. The blade is still offset like this, so I'm going to go more toward that heavy side. And now these shavings are very close to being the same thickness. If you listen, listen carefully to this. You hear how they sound very, very similar? One, two, again. They sound almost identical. They all look very, very similar in thickness. That's a well-set blade. Now, the surface quality on the edge is pretty good. Let's see what it's actually doing on the surface of a piece. All right, let's see what kind of surface we can get off of this. Feels good. Looks excellent. No tear out. No surface deviations whatsoever. These shavings look good. They look consistent. Beautiful, man. Beautiful. Oh, I hear you. I hear you saying, Eric, that's fine and well. Great, you can plane a piece of pine. That's super difficult to do. What about something maybe a little bit more figured, maybe a little bit more dense? That's something uh, traditionally known to be difficult to hand plane. Oh, weird, okay. Let's go ahead and plane this piece of curly maple and see what happens. Now I do want the record to show before we begin that this piece has not only high, high figure, but also, I don't know, can you see the amount of tear out that's already on here from the thicknesser? This came straight out of a helical head and this thing is torn to pieces. Look at this. So we're gonna try to clean this up and see if we can't get a nice surface off of here. Same setup as before but I'm gonna take a lighter cut because I don't wanna dig into these fibers. 
So, no cut, slowly advance the blade, just a little, maybe a, a 30 second of a turn of the wheel there. Now we're starting to get a cut. You can hear that. You can see those quasi shavings coming out. Okay, little by little, taking off those high points. I'm gonna skew the blade. You can see I'm going at an angle rather than straight on just to give a little bit of a slicing action. You can see how fine these shavings are that are coming out. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, just feathery fine. It looks good. I still got a little bit of tear out to get past back here. So let's keep going. And that, that, look at that. Look at that. That's a beautiful thing right there. And this, now, now we're cooking with fire. I just want you all to get a, a look at the surface quality on here. First of all, can you see the striations and the undulations in this wood? It's just stunning. I know you can't feel this right now, but listen, it feels just smooth as eggs, right? And man, let's see if we can get a glint off of here. I mean, it is, I mean, it's perfect, right? It's a perfect surface right off the plane, off of those water stones. Now I'm fully aware this is not a comprehensive sharpening exposition, so let's answer some potential FAQs rapid fire style. How often do I need to sharpen? Often enough. How do I know when I need to sharpen? When your tool is dull. How do I know when my tool is dull? Now that, that is actually an excellent question. It comes with practice, it comes with time, it comes with using a myriad of dull tools and then occasionally using somebody's sharp tool and feeling the difference. Now poetic and lovely as that all sounds, I realize that's not practical advice, so here's kind of three practical keys to clue you in as to whether or not your tool is dull. Number one, tear out. If your plane is tearing out, it's probably a sign that it's a little bit dull and could use a sharpen. Sure, you may be going against the grain. Sure, it may be really difficult grain to plane. There's a myriad of reasons it could be tearing out, but it never hurts to sharpen up your plane iron if it is tearing out, because even if you are going against the grain, if your blade is super, super sharp, you should be able to plane no problem 90% of the time. Number two, Chatter. Now this is especially true of the old Stanleys with the thinner blades, but if you're going along the cut and the blade is chattering, creating those reverberation marks on the surface of the wood, that generally means that the blade is dull and is not engaging the fibers as cleanly as it needs to, so it's time to take them back to the stones and clean them up. Number three, skipping at the beginning of the cut. If you start to make a cut and you realize that that blade is kind of skipping over the first inch or two of the material, that's likely a sign similar to chatter that it's not engaging the fibers at the very beginning of the cut and it's taking a little extra oomph from either the weight of the blade or the strength of the operator to actually engage the blade in those fibers. So it's no longer slicing cleanly and that could be a sign that you need to sharpen up. What angle should I sharpen at? Yes, I've got multiple angles on my sharpening setup, but the truth is 99% of the time nowadays, I'm sharpening at 35 degrees. And that's mostly for simplicity's sake, it's just easier to remember to sharpen at 35 degrees, but in practice, I don't think it makes much of a difference what angle you sharpen at. Do I have to flatten water stones? Yes. How often? As often as you need to. But seriously, how often? Not that often. I generally recommend that you flatten them every time you use them just because it's easier to maintain them that way and you get in a habit. But realistically, every five to 10 times I use them, I take them to a piece of sandpaper on a stone and I just flatten them up real quick. It takes no more than 30 seconds to do both stones. How do I flatten them? That's an excellent question. Let me show you. I'm just gonna get a little bit of water on here. I'm gonna take the stone I was just using and I'm just gonna take a handful of strokes. Doesn't have to be much. You can see I've got no imperfections in that surface anymore. 
Now, if you need some visual proof what this is doing, I've got my 10,000 stone, and you see how I've got these striation marks from the actual sharpening process. I'm gonna dip a little water on here. Again, handful of strokes, I don't know how many. Doesn't really matter. You can see it's creating a vacuum in there. So I'm gonna to go to the edge and you see how all of those marks are gone. Let's get a little water on here. All those marks are gone. That surface is perfectly flat and renewed. All this is is a piece of 600 grit sandpaper on a flooring tile. Simple, inexpensive, gets the job done. Okay, so what about chisels? I sharpen my chisels in the exact same way I sharpen my plain irons, including at the same angle. They're all sharpened to 35 degrees. There is one major difference and one important difference between sharpening my plain irons and sharpening my chisels. I never use the ruler trick on a chisel. And there's a reason why. I have a chisel here. If I'm using this chisel for paring or for chopping, I wanna make sure I have a flat back on my chisel because as I drive this chisel down, I want to remove material in a straight line. If I have a very slight back bevel on my chisel, as I drive this down, it's going to do this ever so slightly as I go farther and farther down. So my chisels get flattened dead flat on the stone, back and forth, no back bevel on here. The reason it doesn't matter in a plane is very simply because this iron is held at an angle. So if there's a back bevel on this plane iron, all it's really doing is increasing the angle at which the iron meets the wood as you take a shaving, but it's still going to be held in place and that's not going to affect the actual cutting action. Whereas with a chisel, because you're using this freehand, if this has a back bevel on it, there's no way to prevent it from doing that. Now, what about other sharpening systems? Yes, there are a myriad of different sharpening systems you could choose to employ. All of them have benefits and drawbacks. One that I used to use was the diamond stone and strop situation, a la Paul Sellers. Simple system, reliable system. The reason I moved away from it is I found two things. Number one, these diamond stones, which I was told would last a lifetime, wear down over time and they become less and less aggressive and it takes longer and longer to sharpen and it becomes more and more difficult. And I didn't like that at all. And I found after using other types of water stones and ceramic stones that I wasn't getting the best edge off of those anymore. I did really like the strop. I do still use the strop on occasion, depending on the situation, especially with curved tools. So I will employ this from time to time still, but I've largely moved away from the diamond stones. If that's the system you like, if that's the system you use, use it. There's nothing wrong with this system. It's just a personal preference. Now I've also used ceramic stones and oil stones. Both of those are fine. This is just the system that I found works really well for me. And I really, again, I really love the edge I get off of that 10,000 grit stone from Ohishi specifically. Even other water stone brands I found aren't necessarily as good as these stones. So it's just a personal preference. I found this to be the fastest, most efficient, and best edge that I could get for what I'm doing and for what I'm using it for. So that's why I use this system. Do I really need to spend $125 on a Lee Nielsen honing guide? No, no you don't. This is just a personal preference. The reason I like this honing guide particularly is because I can take these jaws off and put longer jaws on, and this allows me to hone my spoke shave blades in the exact same way that I would sharpen a regular plain iron or chisel. So I really do like this system for that. There is a $15 version of this made in Taiwan or somewhere of that nature that is perfectly functional. I still bring that version out on sites with me when I need to do a little hand tool work. I have a little sharpening system I take with me. So it's worth purchasing, but you don't need the expensive version. So that's that friends. That's my sharpening system. Now I do once again want to reiterate, I'm not suggesting this system is necessary for you. I'm not suggesting you go spend money that you don't have on sharpening stones in a whole new setup if you have something that's working for you currently. I just wanted to show you what I do in my practice because people ask for it all the time. If you don't have the budget to spend on expensive stones right now, that's fine. Buy the cheaper versions and buy wood so you can practice and develop skill. That's okay. In time down the road, once those stones wear out, you can spend more money on more expensive stones. What you need to do currently is develop skill. 
Do I think you need to use a honing guide? No. Is it easier for beginners to get a high-end result using a honing guide? Yes. Am I a stubborn clown who really wanted to learn how to freehand sharpen right out of the jump? Absolutely. Your choice is your choice. I hope that this was educational for you in some capacity. But now I'm gonna go make a thing. So, till next time, friends. Thank you.